If you open your Bibles to uh, Revelation 16, I want to show you one of the interesting uh, historical notes about our Bibles. This is an example of how our Bible was put into chapters. Uh, it didn't come that way. It came in books. Uh, and if you know anything about the transmission, the books were written with not even spaces between the letters. It's very interesting. Uh, but two men got involved in the Bible. Uh, the first one was the Archbishop of Canterbury uh, in the 1200s. Uh, by the way, you know him as the one that actually drafted the Magna Carta in history, the Great Charter of uh, England. But uh, Bishop Langton divided the Bible into chapters. While he was riding ho a horse, going between the parishes of England. So he was an English-speaking pastor in England. And look, he must have hit a bump. You know, I mean, the horse must have gone like this, and he drew a line in the, the manuscript of the, he was using of the Bible because chapter 16 of Revelation is exactly right in the middle of an event, and he just goes, whoop, and makes a chapter division because... It starts in verse 5 of chapter 15. I look, and the temple was opened, and out of the temple came the seven angels, verse 6, and one of the four living creatures says this, and the temple was filled with you know, smoke, and the seven angels were completed. And then I heard a, a voice from the temple. It's the very same event. And in our minds, we, we make chapter 16 kind of like something new is starting. But actually, it's just a, it's a big, long event of the smoke coming out of the... Uh, temple in heaven that Mark Strout was talking about in Hebrews. But welcome this morning to the one chapter in the Bible, Revelation 16, that almost everybody in the world has heard of. Because we draw from one word in this chapter all throughout cultures around the world. And it's the last, the very last verse. If you look at chapter 16, uh, in verse... Well, almost, it's the last, it's 16, 16, so it's the last verse of the sixth bowl. It says, a place called in the Hebrew, Armageddon. And in America, we, we use that all the time in the news. Uh, last night, or yesterday, if you know, uh, Fort Meyer or Fort Lauderdale had the largest rain in 1,000 years, 20-some inches. You know what they call it? They call it a rain, a rain Megiddon. Or when there was a large pileup during the snow season, they cars hit each other. They called it a snow Megiddo, or they call it a you know all these things have the the Megiddo thing on the end because they mean it's a big deal. And then everybody else talks about the end of the world as Armageddon. So you get to be in the chapter that everybody knows one word from uh, Revelation 16. But look what this chapter is about. The whole purpose of the chapter. By the way, the Battle of Armageddon isn't in the chapter. It's in chapter 19, but it's introduced here. But what chapter 16 is about is what happens when people get what they really want. It's the most dangerous thing. Let, let's look at that today. Uh, Revelation has seven clear parts. And uh, we've gone through Christ's church on earth and how that affects how we should live. Then we see ourselves in heaven, which is one of the great hopes, uh, as Mark Strout was talking about, all the layers of assurance we have. Here's one of them that Jesus said he's not going to partake in the Lord's table till we're safely home. And he even shows us what it looks like we're safely home right here in chapter 4 and 5. And then again, we're coming to uh, tomorrow, the second coming of Christ. But we're right at the end. We're ending the tribulation uh, in, in this little sequence we're going through right now. And then we're going to go through the other events. To remember it graphically, We've covered the church on earth, the church is in heaven, now we're in that big red uh, zone of the, of the terrible part of Revelation. But let's just talk about what happens in chapter 15. The whole 15th chapter that we were in yesterday is about the context for the finale of the tribulation. And the context is the worship of God in heaven. And what's interesting is what I read to you a moment ago when I talked to you about uh, Bishop Langton's divisions by the way, how did we get our verses? A printer put them in. In Geneva. Uh, his name was Robert Estien. He put them in in the 16th century. So anytime you hear someone tell you that, you know, there's something fascinating about the fact that every 316, you know, John 316, Malachi 316, and all these other 316s are a sign of something, 
It wasn't a sign before the 16th century because there were no verses. It wasn't a sign before the 12th century because there were no chapters. The Bible was one long manuscript and it was intact and perfect in the Word of God, but we see it today in this form because a printer wanted to make it accessible. Everyone have their own copy and he put in the verse numbers. But look at verse 8 of chapter 15. The temple in heaven was filled with smoke from the glory of God, from his power. No one could go in the temple until the seven plagues of the seven angels were completed. That's this is a, a crescendo. It's a, kind of like that climactic moment in Revelation. Let's see what happens, okay? Chapter 15 says the seven angels are queued up. They're standing on the edge of the platform there of heaven overlooking earth. And they're, they're holding, and now look at these are jars. That's the only graphic I could find, find in Keynote, you know. The word in Hebrew, or the word in Greek, goes back to the Hebrew saucers that they used in the temple worship. They were kind of like uh, what we would call like a serving bowl for either salad or soup. They're shallow and, and wide. They're not, you know, little things, and they're not cups. They're like basins, we might call them. And so these angels are all standing there on the edge with earth below the throne of God and his temple, and they come up with these, and what they do with them is they just dump them out. And what it speaks of is a rapid fire pouring out of God's wrath, as it's called. So first of all, soars on men with the mark of the beast. So everybody that's taken the mark beyond everything else, their, their mark becomes like a cancerous sore. A uh, sea of blood and everything dies. Now, you notice I'm tracking with you uh, the the seals of chapter 6 we saw, the trumpet judgments of chapters 8 through 11 we saw, and now the bowls of 15 to 16 are all interconnected in this sense. Uh, if you go to Russia, you can buy one of those Matryoshka dolls, and it's a, you know, it's a wooden thing, all different heights, and it's got a little mark in the middle, and if you turn it like this, you take the lid off. There's another one right inside of it. And the more you pay, the more deeply these little Matryoshka dolls nest inside of each other till you get to the very last one. It's just a little tiny thing. Very much like what this is like. The, the seals actually encompass the entire tribulation because the last uh, uh, part of the seal that we saw in chapter 6, and actually it goes on into chapter 7, is this huge earthquake and everything's over. Then the trumpets also... Uh, are enclosed, but they also have a seventh that's a finale, just like we're going to see the seventh here. So there's a connection there, but they're telescopic. The seals, and then a lesser length of time, the trumpets, and then a very short period of time, what we're looking at here. So the seals cover the entire length of the seven years. The trumpets cover a much less, perhaps even half of the seven years, and then these bowls, these poured out quickly saucers are very truncated, they're very short. So we see that that also they're they're covering, like the sea is impacted in bowl number two, just as the sea is impacted in trumpet number two. Uh, Again, all the rivers and waters are affected by bowl number three. Wormwood does the same thing, only to only a third of them. So the trumpets were just like foretaste of the horrors of the bowls. The sun... Uh, gets struck in the fourth, and so does the sun in the fourth trumpet. Darkness in the beast kingdom, which parallels the opening of that uh, abyss that we looked at. The Euphrates River is king. That's where we get to uh, Armageddon. And again, notice the Euphrates uh, are again mentioned in the trumpets, but do you remember it was to let loose those demon hordes? So they were two different events that I reminded you of. Then we have this three demon spirits like frogs gather people together for the battle of God Almighty. The battle, Armageddon isn't where the battle is. Everyone talks about the battle of Armageddon, but, but there really isn't a battle at Armageddon. Everybody's staging there. It's, you know, maybe 90 miles north of Jerusalem, and, but that's where all the armies are staging. Armies usually do that. They all come and gather, and they get ready, and then they go. 
So they've all gathered there, and Jesus comes on his way to Jerusalem, where the real battle is going to be, because they want to destroy all the Jews, because the Antichrist has herded together, and all the Jews are in one place, Zechariah 12 to 14 tells us, and Jesus is coming, and here's Armageddon, there's Jerusalem, and as he's coming by Armageddon, we'll see in chapter 19, he just speaks a word, and all of the people gathered in Armageddon are killed, and birds start eating them, and then he goes and rescues Jerusalem. So they're all brought there to the staging area by these three frog-like demons, and then the last bowl, it is done. You go, boy, that's really interesting. Yeah, and it wasn't even written to us, primarily. It was written to a group of people that were second-generation Christians, because Jesus has always had the same desire, that we fulfill his purpose in our generation. And the remember what Jack Wurtson said, you know, it's the duty of every Christian to reach their generation for Christ, you know. Uh, that's, boy, Jack was just tracking with the scripture. We're supposed to live for God in our world that's going to be getting darker and darker from our perspective because evil men and seducers, as the Bible says, wax worse and worse. But Jesus wanted to see, and he still does, whether the people were actually responding in their hearts. Now, do you remember we looked at the big picture of the message of Revelation? Uh, The big picture of this section we're in, concluding in in verse 16, is lost humanity believes in evolution, reveres the earth, denies biblical creationism, so God sends environmental disasters. Boy, does that wake people up. Uh, God the Son, who happens to be the creator, systematically destroys everything that keeps life alive on earth. And when I told you yesterday in chapter 8 that that briefly in the silence of God, it says the wind didn't blow, can you imagine with all the smoke from the one-third of the grass and one-third of the trees, you know, burning, the whole world has smoke, and all of a sudden the wind stops? It'd be uh, very arresting that the atmosphere is no longer producing oxygen from my lungs. The oceans which are a primary oxygen producer. The the most important oxygen production is the microplankton out there in the ocean. And the land and all the trees and earthquakes ravage the earth and smoke and fire and red tides. Global warming at extreme levels. And volcanoes. There was just a volcano in in, uh, far eastern Russia that put five inches of ash on everything. It just looks, again... The news called it apocalyptic, and they're coming back to the book of Revelation. I I thought that was very interesting that secular news medias use Bible terms. They don't even think about it. It, It's a a Carmageddon, it's a Firemageddon, it's an Armageddon event, or an apocalyptic Revelation event. And asteroids, comets, and meteors, then, today, comes Armageddon. Well, what's fascinating is, The people that got this initially, the book of Revelation, had to live everyday life. They were working, just like we do. They had to earn enough money. They had to, you know, have a place to live, and they had to have food to eat. They had to clothe themselves and their family. They had to go through everyday life, and they got this book. And what this book was intended to do is to show them what we're seeing. What specifically in chapter 16? This. Uh, What happens when people get what they really want? Earth becomes a living hell. You see, God is not willing that any should perish. We all know that. God is constantly warning people. Every time a person has a little cough or a sneeze or a runny nose or an ache or a pain or you go up the stairs too fast and you go, whoa, you know, a little shortness of breath. What is that for? To remind us we're temporary. We're fragile. Life is temporary. Life is fragile. Death is inevitable. No one escapes it. And then, you know, when you get someone's attention with that, you go, and Christ is the only answer. So what does Jesus show the whole world? Now remember, he's still got, in chapter 16, we're just coming off the 144,000 finishing their ministry. The two witnesses are still doing their ministry. They're actually going to be killed, you know, during this final run-up of all these bulls. And the gospel angel we saw yesterday is is loudly 
in every language. He's kind of got Google Translate going. He's giving the gospel to everybody. And to help illustrate, if you reject Christ, chapter 16's events. So chapter 16's events are, are rapidly, everybody on earth that has gotten the mark of the beast, which is about everybody left, is, is that mark on their hand or their forehead starts uh, kind of like uh, turning black when someone gets frostbitten or, or when infection comes, you know, we call it gangrenous. And it starts oozing. That's what happens. And the whole ocean dies. Every fresh, I mean, we thought water was polluted, you know, by all the things it's polluted by, but now all the water gets polluted. And then the sun ramps up by a third. And then there's three days of absolute darkness. All those are little tastes of hell. Those are all what hell is going to be like. There's going to be this pain and this thirst and this, the horror and the darkness. and I mean, scorching with fire and darkness. That's exactly how God describes hell. Suffering the vengeance of eternal fire in the blackness of darkness forever. That's how Jude describes hell. So God gives everybody a taste of hell. So what's the first lesson we learn? Look, look at chapter 16. I heard a loud voice from heaven saying, go pour out the bowls. Verse 2, the first went and poured out his bowls. So the first angel comes up to the edge, boom, just dumps this bowl of God's wrath. And look what happens. A foul and loathsome sore came upon the men who had the mark of the beast and those who worshipped his image. Wow. This life without Jesus is like getting incurable cancer. You know, cancer is a big thing. People are dreadfully afraid of dying of cancer. And so if someone thinks they have cancer, they will do anything to remediate it. See what God's doing? He's saying, hey, life without me is like incurable cancer. Uh, What's interesting is we keep reading, the second angel pours out his bowl and the sea became blood like a dead man and every living creature in the sea died, which is going to be a horrific event. Then the third angel poured out his bowl on the springs and waters and the angel says, look at verse 4, because where do these angels come from? They come out of that temple right in front of the throne of God and it's, it's a part of worship. The wrath of God is part of worship. Did you know the wrath of God is one of his 25 attributes? All of God's attributes are equal. It isn't like God is 99% love and always a little bit wrathful. No, he is completely love and completely wrath and completely mercy and completely holy. See, we like to kind of design God what fits with the way we think. God is absolutely perfect in all. And so look what they say. You're righteous, Lord even dumping out this wrath. The one who is, the one who was, and who is to be, because you've judged these things, they have shed the blood of saints and prophets, and you've given the blood to drink. And then verse 7, even so, Lord God Almighty, true and righteous are your judgments. Everything but God decays. But God, as we've seen over and over again, is eternally self-sufficient. He doesn't need anything. And he's showing... He's just taking his hands off and letting the earth decay. He holds all things together by the word of his power. The reason that the earth is even continuing today is because the Lord's holding it, Colossians 1 tells us. During the tribulation, he lets it slip a little bit. Well, next, what we learn, the third element from chapter 16 is life without Jesus is like dying of thirst in the desert. Uh, the springs of water, verse 4, become like blood. You can't drink them. Life without Jesus is like living in total darkness. Look at verse 10. Um, after they're scorched, verse 10, the fifth angel poured out his bowl on the throne of the beast and the kingdom became full of darkness and they gnawed their tongues because of the pain. And they blasphemed the God of heaven because of their pain, their sores. And then look at this sad note. They won't listen to the gospel angel. They would not repent of their deeds. What is repentance? A change, the Greek word metanoia, means a change of mind 
that leads to a change of behavior. God says, change your mind. You're not in charge, I am. Change your mind. You are not a God, I am the one and only true and living God. Change your mind. Say, God, I don't want to be like I am. I don't want to be a rebel, I want you. And the Lord says, whoever calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Now you all know that verse from Romans, right? Romans 10, whoever calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Where does it come from? It's from the Old Testament talking about the tribulation. It was prophesied in the Old Testament, in the Minor Prophets, by those that were foreseeing this very event we're looking at now, that at the ultimate moment of the tribulation, when, when people are, are burning up and, and dying of thirst, and, and you know, they're oozing with these sores, the Lord says, if you'll just call out to me, say, God, be merciful to me. God, save me. Help. I want, please help. Kind of like we, we see in John 3.16, Jesus tells Nicodemus, as the serpent was lifted up in the wilderness, the Son of Man must be lifted up. Why did he say that? Because when the serpent was lifted up in the wilderness, the camp of Israel in Exodus was 81 square miles. The serpent was lifted up on a pole in the center. That means people could be as far as four and a half miles from that pole, dying of snake bites, unable to move. And all they had to do is by faith look toward the source of salvation. That's the same going on in the tribulation. That's what's going on today when we lead people to Christ. So what happens when someone that's dying of thirst and living in total darkness and oozing with this incurable cancer of sin looks toward the Lord? Well, real quickly, I'll tell you one quick story. Let, let me show you Titus chapter 3. This verse will, in fact, Titus became, after this event, one of my favorite books in the Bible. Um, Titus chapter 3, 3 to 7. It says this, For we ourselves were also once foolish, disobedient, deceived, serving various lusts and pleasures, living in malice and envy, hateful and hating one another, when the kindness and love of God our Savior toward man appeared. I was, Bonnie and I were uh, brand new in the ministry. We were in Rhode Island. I was pastoring a historic church there that was 165 years old. And I was happy as a clam living in a, a parsonage the church built for the pastors in 1828. Two acres of, it was beautiful. I mean, flowers and gardens, it was just wonderful. We even tapped our trees and made maple syrup. And I was busily in my office working. I had the secretary that all the pastors had. She was like 90 years old. She'd always, and I was just a brand new 30-year-old pastor, and she was 90 years old, knew everything. And I heard her outside the door of my study as I was preparing my message for Sunday, I heard her going, no, 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 no. And then I heard a boom of her against the door. And all of a sudden the door opened and there Kay was. She's only about this tall. And she was trying not to touch this man. She was going like this. And this man looked like the Hulk. Now I knew exactly who he was. Everyone in our town knew who he was. Ex-Special Forces, ex-Black Belt, ex-Green Beret, ex-everything, you know, highest level black belt. He walked every day. He was, you know, uh, got his military pension, I guess. He walked with two 10-pounders, and he just walked our town like this, going with two 10-pound weights like this. I mean, he didn't do it for a minute. He did it for hours. He just went like this. And he was built like every muscle. He didn't have a six-pack. He had like a 16-pack front and back, and he liked it. He never wore a shirt. He wore sweat. And he wore his little shorts and showed off his gigantic legs. So we all saw him. He walked everywhere in town. He even walked through our parking lot on Sundays. Boy, you should see the mothers. They would pull their kids back because this, this gigantic muscle man with his weights would just drip sweat through the parking lot and look at everybody. So here he is in my office dripping on my 90-year-old secretary going like this. And he said, Father, I knew he was addressing me because the whole state is Roman Catholic, you know, Rhode Island is. So he thought I was a priest. He said, Father, and then he stopped his weights and he looked at me and he said, I, I, I came today because I have one question. I said, yes. And Kay kind of figured it was safe, so she left. And so he's in my office and he sets his 10 pounders down and starts dripping on my floor, you know, all the sweat. And he said, when I walk through your parking lot of your parish, he said, I 
feel and see in the people something I can't explain. He said, it's peace. He said, your people have peace. He said, I feel it. He said, that's why. He said, I don't know if you know, but I walk through. I said, I know. I've seen you. I know you walk through a parking lot. He said, I walk through it because I feel you guys have something. What do you have? Well, I thought, this is great. So I just opened my Bible to the Romans Road, which I had marked in my Bible. You know, when I was your age, I marked how to, and I think they do that with you with open air, how to lead someone to Christ from the book of Romans. And I had all the little things marked. So I was standing like this, and I was going through it, and, and I went through all the parts, you know, that, that Christ died for sinners, and salvation is a gift, and you have to receive Christ. And I was just lifting up my eyes to, to look him in the eye and say, what would keep you from receiving Christ? And with my Bible hand, right here, I looked up, and he wasn't there anymore. And I thought, I took too long. He left. So I was like this, reading. And I went like this, and like this, and like this. He was down on his hands and knees with his forehead on the carpet where he would drip the water. And he said, I want it. And so I got down the floor with him. I said, well, it's not it, it's him. You want him. You want Christ, right? He said, yes. And he just prayed the sweetest prayer and received Christ. I mean, I thought, well, that's interesting. I mean, he barged in, told me he wanted to be saved, listened to the gospel. Got Very few people fall down on their face before the Lord when they get saved. And so before he left with his two barbells, he had kind of stopped sweating. I said, I gave him a paperback New Testament, kind of like Pocket Testament League, like Word of Life used to pass out and, and, or still does. And I gave him that, and I said, you should start reading the Word of God and come to church Sunday. This was, you know, like Wednesday. Sunday, he was in church. It's the first time I ever saw him with clothes on. I don't know where he got him. And he came to church, and he was radically transformed, and he came up to me. Now, this is Wednesday to Thursday to Friday to Saturday to Sunday. Four days had gone by. He came up with his little paperback Bible, and he went like this. I found myself in the Bible. I said, really? Where? He said, it's Titus. I said, Titus, okay. You know, that was Titus to him. Titus. I said, okay. He said, for we ourselves, verse 3, were also once foolish, disobedient, deceived, serving various lusts and pleasures, living in malice, envy, hateful, hating one another. And then the kindness and love of God our Savior toward man appeared, not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to his mercy he saved us through the washing of regeneration, renewing of the Holy Spirit. And that incredible man, and boy, did I learn so much about him. I discipled him. I baptized him. He became a dear friend. He sent me a wedding invitation. We still stay in touch. He sends me Christmas cards. What God does to people like the power walker that I'm telling you about is he takes them from their blindness and their thirst. I mean, you know what this man did? I'll just tell you. One story he told me. I mean, he is big. He said that he would go to the bar every Friday night, and he'd walk around till he found the most outwardly appealing woman in the bar. And he would intentionally slide whoever was sitting next to her at the bar. He'd push into the chair and slide him off the chair, and he'd just start, you know, going to talking to her and saying, hey, you know, telling her she's beautiful and saying you'll buy her a drink, hoping the boyfriend will get mad. I mean, wouldn't you get mad if you'd paid for some girl and brought her and, and someone pushes you out? He was just waiting for that because as soon as they got mad and pushed him, he would knock them out. He, he was so strong and, you know, kind of like special forces guy. He said, I loved doing that. He said, I loved winning the, the prettiest girl in the bar. And he said, and I was the emptiest person in the world. He said, I had everything I wanted. I fought and, and knocked people out for it. And he said, I had all the alcohol, all the sex, all the muscles, all the... He says, when I took off my shirt at the gym, people would stop and go, oh. you know, like they'd never have that. He said, but Titus 3... 
I was empty, thirsty, dying. It was like hell on earth when the grace of God found me. Well, that's what the Lord wants us to do. Uh, I did disciple him and showed him how he got, and this is in your notes. This is from John Piper. You all heard of John Piper? It's his little poem called Anthem, A-N-T-H-E-M. And I actually have used this for since Piper wrote it. Avoid the sights and situation that arouse unfitting desire and say no to every lustful thought and turn your mind forcefully away and hold the promises of Christ. Enjoy a superior satisfaction and move into useful activity. And you know, this guy did. And he became one of the most radiant believers uh, serving the Lord. So life without Jesus is as futile as, and let's go back to chapter 16. Look what the finale is where Armageddon is mentioned. The sixth angel, verse 12, pours his bowl on the Euphrates River, dries it up for the kings of the east to be prepared. The three unclean spirits I told you about, like frogs, go out and get the world going. Uh, Verse 14, they perform signs. Remember, we already talked about fire from heaven and all that. And they, they are the spirits of demons, and they gather them together, verse 14, for the battle of the great day of God. That's the battle of Jerusalem. And behold, I'm coming as a thief. Blessed is he who watches. This is one of the Beatitudes. You'll find several of them in Revelation. And they're gathered together to the place called in Hebrew Armageddon. And as I told you in chapter 19, the battle of Armageddon turns out to not be a battle. God just speaks a word, pierces them through, and they all die. Life without Jesus is as futile as Armageddon's war against God. They didn't get to do their war. They just It was empty. It was nothing. It was futile. How does God fit together these passages? Now, here's the big thing. This is what the whole world wonders about. Revelation 16, right here, talks about Armageddon. Daniel 11 talks about something that sounds a lot alike. Ezekiel 38 and 39 talks about something. There's even this unusual passage in Psalm 83. So, we'll put them all together. If you look at what Zechariah talks about, and I'm not teaching Zechariah, one of the minor prophets, but Zechariah devotes three chapters to this event. Chapter 12, chapter 13, chapter 14. And currently, you know, can you imagine if John saw, you know, an F-16 like that? I mean, doesn't that look a little bit like a locust or something? I don't know. It's got, uh, how would he describe modern weaponry? Very difficultly, okay? But Revelation foretells God's coming wrath as he's coming to defend Israel at a future battle that starts in Armageddon. Now, why is God doing this? Because Hosea 5.15, Jeremiah 31, Zechariah 12, God says, I've staked my name on Israel, and Satan knows that. God says, these are my chosen people of promise. They're going to provide the scripture. They're going to provide the Savior. They're going to provide. And so God says, I am going to get them safely uh, as my chosen people to believe in me and they're actually the gates of my city and I'm calling it New Jerusalem. So when Satan started understanding God's plan, that God is staking his reputation on saving a nation called Israel, an ethnic group of people, the descendants of Abraham, I mean, Satan's gone into overdrive. Jerusalem during the tribulation period is when all the nations of the earth turn against the Jews. All. Right now, not all. The Western world a lot is either neutral or helping Israel. All the nations of the earth, it says in Zechariah. By the way, God calls the Jews my people. And they turn against Jerusalem, any Jews being in there, and God calls Jerusalem my city. So see, we've got a little conflict here. God said it's my city, et cetera, et cetera. So the Lord goes forth in Zechariah and fights. When does that happen? Well, here are one of those many charts. In Daniel's 70 weeks, 69 weeks, Jesus is crucified. The temple is destroyed. There's an interval we call the church period. The the rapture takes place, but what we're going to see in Ezekiel 38 and 39, it's unclear whether that happens just before the rapture or after the rapture, and it's concurrent with the Battle of Armageddon. But what we do know in the 70th week, the temple is rebuilt somewhere in the first half. The covenant is enforced. 
the Antichrist sets up that image, the Terminator image. The second half is called the Great Tribulation. This is the second coming of Christ at the Battle of Armageddon when he saves the Jews and launches the millennium. So that's just a typical chart. What does it look like today? This is out of Bloomberg. The Middle East Cold War is being mapped. Russia is aligned with Iran, Iraq, Syria, Lebanon, and Yemen. That was last month. This month, guess what? Saudi Arabia has made overtures to make peace with Iran, and Turkey has made it clear that they're aligning with Iran. Wow. So that just muddles up all of our charts. What does Psalm 83 say? Well, Psalm 83, 6 to 8 says there's going to be a war when all of these groups come against Israel. Now, you know what a lot of people say? Oh, it's talking about the past. Well, if it's talking about the past, there was never a time. These civilizations are not concurrent. They're, they're, I mean, they're not contemporary. They're, they're following one another. They never all existed at the same time, yet Psalm 83 says they're all going to come together against Israel. So Psalm 83 is an enigma. What Ezekiel tells us is a lot clearer. He names what we call northern Africa with Ethiopia, with Iran, which is the most clearly named, with what we would call the armies of the north, uh, which would be a lot of these Muslim stands, you know, Uzbekistan, Turkmenistan, Kazakhstan, and all those. And he even names the Scythian people, which are the forefathers of the Russian. Now, what could prompt this? What triggers Armageddon? Well, here, what's the date of that article? Um, it was two days ago when I clipped it, but it was last week. Iran is soon going to have a nuclear weapon. And that's a, an American F-35, which they have a lot of. Could that trigger it if it's before the rapture? What Ezekiel tells us is, look at this. This is the Armageddon coalition. Magog, which is southern Russia. Uh, Gomer Tagarma, which is basically Turkey and, and Syria right there. Persia, which is Iran. Libya, which is Libya. And Ethiopia, which is Ethiopia. And that coalition, the Bible says, comes against Israel. But what's interesting is in modern times, Turkey is a NATO member with us, not with Russia. But on April 8th, Turkey aligns with Iran against Israel. And I ask, are we starting to see the end of days? And of course, you know what everyone asks? What happens to the USA? What does happen to the USA? Well, I have a whole class on that, not here, but what about an EMP? What about one electromagnetic explosion? It would wipe out our electronics. What would we do without that? What about civil war? That looks more likely. How about a financial meltdown? That's already happening. What about utter moral decay where nobody cares and no one will fight for anything? What about all of that? I mean, we're even now behind in the hypersonic department. This is our proposed hypersonic but Russia's already using theirs on the Ukraine, and China's already, China sent one up to show off about three months ago, and they sent up their hypersonic and went around the whole world three times before it hit the target. It's that fast, 25,000 miles an hour. Boom. So, Daniel 11 tells us this. Four groups come to Armageddon. The kings of the north, the kings of the east, the kings of the south, and the Antichrist forces. Now, basically, what's fascinating is, again, you know, as she visits Russia and Putin sees his U.S. world order taking, anti-world order taking place, are the kings of the east all of China's orbit? Are the kings of the north all of Russia's orbit? Well, the purpose of Revelation 16 is life without Jesus is just total fear and dread. See, all the early Christians didn't get maps and start trying to figure this out. What they did is they started talking to their neighbors about how to come to Christ. And what did they tell them? They said, if you don't come to Christ, your life will become a living hell. So that's the message of Revelation 16, 